Chapter 18. Charles Kent. Half an hour later saw Poirot, myself, and Inspector Raglan in the train on the way to Liverpool. The inspector was clearly very excited. We may get a line on the blackmailing part of the business, if nothing else, he declared jubilantly. He's a rough customer, this fellow, by what I heard over the phone. Takes dope, too. We ought to find it easy to get what we want out of him. If there was a shadow of a motive, nothing's more likely than that he killed Mr. Ackroyd. But in that case, why is young Peyton keeping out of the way? The whole thing's a muddle, that's what it is. By the way, Monsieur Poirot, you were quite right about those fingerprints. They were Mr. Ackroyd's own. I rather had the same idea myself, but I dismissed it as hardly feasible. I smiled to myself. Inspector Raglan was so very plainly saving his face. As regard this man, said Poirot, he is not yet arrested, eh? No, detained under suspicion. And what account does he give of himself? Precious little, said the inspector with a grin. He's a wary bird, I gather. A lot of abuse, but very little more. On arrival at Liverpool, I was surprised to find that Poirot was welcomed with acclamation. Superintendent Hayes, who met us, had worked with Poirot over some case long ago and had evidently an exaggerated opinion of his powers. Now we've got Mr. Poirot here. We shan't be long, he said cheerfully. I thought you retired, Moussour. So I had, my good Hayes, so I had. But how tedious is retirement. You cannot imagine to yourself the monotony with which day comes after day. Very likely. So you've come to have a look at our own particular find. Is this Dr. Shepherd? Think you'll be able to identify him, sir? I'm not very sure, I said doubtfully. How did you get hold of him? inquired Poirot. Description was circulated, as you know, in the press and privately. Not much to go on, I admit. This fellow has an American accent, all right, and he doesn't deny that he was near King's Abbot that night. Just asks what the hell it is to do with us, and that he'll see us in uh, before he answers any questions. Is it permitted that I too see him? asked Poirot. The superintendent closed one eye knowingly. Very glad to have you, sir. You've got permission to do anything you please. Inspector Jap of Scotland Yard was asking after you the other day. Said he heard you were connected unofficially with this case. Where's Captain Peyton hiding, sir? Can you tell me that? I doubt if it would be wise at the present juncture, said Poirot primly, and I bit my lips to prevent a smile. The little man really did it very well. After some further parley, we were taken to interview the prisoner. He was a young fellow, I should say not more than twenty-two or three, tall, thin, with slightly shaking hands, and the evidences of considerable physical strength somewhat run to seed. His hair was dark, but his eyes were blue and shifty, seldom meeting a glance squarely. I had all along cherished the illusion that there was something familiar about the figure I had met that night, but if this were indeed he, I was completely mistaken. He did not remind me in the least of anyone I knew. "'Now then, Kent,' said the superintendent, "'stand up. Here are some visitors to come, come to see you. Recognize any of them?' Kent glared at us suddenly." sullenly but did not reply i saw his glance waver over the three of us and come back to rest on me well sir said the superintendent to me what do you say the height's the same i said and as far as general appearance goes it might well be the man in question beyond that i couldn't go what the hell's the meaning of all this the American accent? asked kent What have you got against me? Come on, out with it. What am I supposed to have done? I nodded my head. It's the man, I said. I recognize the voice. Recognize my voice, do you? Where do you think you heard it before? 
on Friday evening last, outside the gates of Fernley Park. You asked me the way there. I did, did I? Do you admit it? asked the inspector. I don't admit anything, not till I know what you've got on me. Have you not read the papers in the last few days? asked Poirot, speaking for the first time. The man's eyes narrowed. So that's it, is it? I saw an old gent had been croaked at Fernley, trying to make out I did the job, are you? You were there that night, said Poirot quietly. How do you know, mister? By this. Poirot took something from his pocket and held it out. It was the goose quill we had found in the summer house. At the sight of it, the man's face changed. He half held out his hand. Snow said Poirot thoughtfully. No, my friend, it is empty. It lay where you dropped it in the summer house that night. Charles Kent looked at him uncertainly. You seem to know a hell of a lot about everything, you little foreign cock duck. Perhaps you remember this. The papers say that the old gent was croaked between a quarter to ten and ten o'clock. That is so, agreed Poirot. Yes, but is it really so? That's what I'm getting at. This gentleman will tell you, said Poirot. He indicated Inspector Raglan. The latter hesitated, glanced at Superintendent Hayes, then at Poirot, and finally, as though receiving sanction, he said, That's right. Between a quarter to ten and ten o'clock. Then you've got... Then you've nothing to keep me here for, said Kent. I was away from Fernley Park by twenty-five minutes past nine. You can ask at the dog and whistle. That's a saloon about a mile out of Fernley on the road to Cranchester. I kicked up a bit of a row there, I remember. As near as nothing to quarter to ten it was. How about that? Inspector Raglan wrote down something in his notebook. Well demanded Kent. Inquiries will be made, said the inspector. If you've spoken the truth, you won't have anything to complain about. What were you doing at Fernley Park anyway? Went there to meet someone. Who? That's none of your business. You better keep a civil tongue in your head, my man, the superintendent warned him. To hell with a civil tongue. I went there on my own business, and that's all there is to it. If I was clear away before the murder was done, that's all that concerns the cops. Your name? It is Charles Kent, said Poirot. Where were you born? The man stared at him. Then he grinned. I'm a full bone Britisher, all right, he said. Yes, said Poirot meditatively. I think you are. I fancy you were born in Kent. The man stared. Was that because of my name? What's that to do with it? Is a man whose name is Kent bound to be born in that particular county? Under certain circumstances, I imagine he might be, said Poirot very deliberately. Under certain circumstances, you comprehend. There was so much meaning in his voice as to surprise the two police officers. As for Charles Kent, he flushed a brick red, and for a moment I thought he was going to spring at Poirot. He thought better of it, however, and turned away with a kind of laugh. Poirot nodded as though satisfied, and made his way out through the door. He was jointly present. He was joined pr presently by the two officers. We'll verify that statement," remarked Baglin. "I don't think he's lying, though. But he's got to come clean with a statement as to what he was doing at Fernley. It looks to me as though we'd got our blackmailer all right. On the other end, granted his story's correct, he couldn't have had anything to do with the actual murder." He'd got ten pounds on him when he was arrested, rather a large sum. I fancy that forty pounds went to him. The numbers of the notes didn't correspond. But of course he'd have changed them first thing. Mr. Ackroyd must have given him the money, and he made off with it as fast as possible. What with that about Kent being his birthplace? What's that got to do with it? Nothing whatever, said Poirot mildly. A little idea of mine, that was all. Me, I am famous for my little ideas. Are you really? said Raglan, studying him with a puzzled expression. The superintendent went into a roar of laughter. Many's the time I've heard Inspector Japp say that Monsieur Poirot and his little ideas. Too fanciful for me, he'd say, but always something in them. You mock yourself at me, said Poirot, smiling. But never mind. The old ones, they laugh last sometimes when the young clever ones do not laugh at all. And nodding his head at them in a sage manner, he walked out into the street. He and I lunched together at a hotel. I know now that the whole thing lay clearly unraveled before him. He had got the last thread he needed to lead him to the truth. 
but at the time I had no suspicion of the fact. I overestimated his general self-confidence, and I took it for granted that the things which puzzled me must be equally puzzling to him. My chief puzzle was what the man Charles Kent could have been doing at Fernley. Again and again I put the question to myself and could get no satisfactory reply. At last I ventured a tentative query to Poirot. His reply was immediate. Mon ami, I do not think. I know. Really? I said incredulously. Yes, indeed. I suppose now that to you it would not make sense if I said that he went to Fernley that night because he was born in Kent? I stared at him. It certainly doesn't seem to make sense to me, I said dryly. Ah, said Poirot pityingly. Well, no matter. I have still my little idea.